Hello, Internet. Hello, Chapter 16 friends and family far and wide. Uh, I'm Patrick. I'm very pleased to be joining you this evening from this, our desolate office space. Um, we are celebrating 50 years of Humanities Tennessee with 50 books uh, from across the state. Um, and so as part of our 50th celebration, we are moving our offices. So you can see cubbies empty behind me, walls that used to have things on them, et cetera. Um, but fear not, you will not be looking at me very long because we are going to be bringing in our illustrious guests here momentarily. So let me uh, gather my notes right here. All right, here we go. Eric Dawson holds a master's in information science from the University of Tennessee and is manager of the McClung Historical Collection at Knox County Public Library. He is also a writer and filmmaker, director of Sutry's Knoxville, a hymn to the past in film and music. And we have David Wesley Williams is the author of the novels Everybody Knows on Jack Leg Press and Long Gone Daddies. His short fiction has appeared in Oxford American, Kenyan Review Online, and in Akashic Books, Memphis Noir. He lives in Memphis. So yes, tonight, in a very special event for Tennessee, we are having all three Grand Divisions uh, present in one, one stream. So we're going from east, I'm in the middle, and we got someone in the west. So here we go. So this conversation is part of the 50 Years 50 Books series at chapter16.org, exploring 50 significant books published in Tennessee in the last 50 years. This program is presented by Humanities Tennessee as part of our 50th anniversary year, and we encourage you to visit chapter16.org for the full list of the books and additional features. And let's get that round of applause going loud enough across the whole state here. Uh, we will be bringing in David and Eric. Thank you. Welcome. The screen is yours. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, hi, David. Uh, good to be hey, Eric. Uh, joining everybody across the state here from East Tennessee to talk about this uh, very special East Tennessee book. And uh, David, you, you wrote an essay for Chapter 16, Desolation Rowboat. Uh, with a Dylan nod there uh, about Sutri. And uh, you stated it was your favorite book ever, not just a McCarthy, not just a Southern book, but favorite book ever. I'm wondering uh, when, when you came to it, what attracted you to the book and what keeps you returning to it? Yeah, uh, I, I start, I'm, I'm from the South. I'm from Kentucky originally. Uh, and I love Southern literature. And I think when I, when I got started to get, Look, you know, look to get deep in, in Southern literature. I think I probably started with with Faulkner mm -hmm. uh, and got from Faulkner or probably I, I immediately got hooked on Faulkner, but probably a more accurate description is kind of like happily lost in Faulkner. And that kind of naturally led to uh, to uh, Cormac McCarthy uh, because I was looking for I'm not a I'm not I'm kind of a slow plotting reader and I'm not mm -hmm. scholarly at all, but I like a challenging read and I love language and, you know, the, the power of words and storytelling. Uh, so I started with uh, Cormac McCarthy's uh, his Tennessee novels uh, and uh, I worked my way to to Sutri. And I, I think it's it, it's I, I've said off and on that it's it's my favorite book and I, there are maybe one or two others that I've said, maybe that's my favorite book, but, but I've submitted that this as Sutri, Sutri as it, because I read it again, read it twice last year, once to do Ooh. the essay, which is the second time I'd read it. And, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it more each time because it's such a, it, it's the language is amazing. I mean, even by Cormac McCarthy standards, uh, you know, the, the, the powerful words and sentences and, and the setting and how the setting is, is, is also a character. Uh, and you know, the scope of it, it has, you know, kind of everything you would want. I mean, I would put it up as worthy of, you know, a great American novel status. Uh, it's also, you know, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of a book like Ulysses. It has similarities like, you know, instead of Dublin, it's, it's, it's Knoxville. Uh, so it, it's, I just think it's an amazing book that rewards each rereading, you know, more and more. Uh, so I, it's definitely my favorite book. It's 
the the competition is over. <laughs> yeah, and especially in uh, contrast with other, I'm I'm sure you've read, as you mentioned, you read early McCarthy, and then his his earlier books are uh, Southern based in in Appalachia here. Sutri sort of being the dividing point because his next one Blood Meridian, and then they become Westerns, and then something else. But uh, a lot of people seem to. You know, I think someone said he found his voice with Blood Meridian, and and don't pay as much attention to those earlier books like Sutri, but uh, you find great value in those, right? Yeah, that's that's actually another reason that I picked the the book when when Maria Browning from Chapter Sixteen uh, invited me to participate in the, in this in this project. She gave me a a list. There was a list of possible books to choose, and I was thrilled that that Sutri was available. And and one reason among you know along with the fact that it's you know the amazing writing and and how much I love the book, it's I also kind of like to champion the uh, McCormick's uh, McCarthy's. Uh, uh, Tennessee books. It seems like they're not as well known or as loved uh, as as his Western and Southwestern books. Blood Meridian being you know chief among them. Uh, and I mean, there's some like casual readers of his who who haven't really read the Tennessee stuff at all, don't really know Sutri. Uh, and like you said, I, there was you know I'm on a, a Facebook. Uh, uh, like a Cormac McCarthy appreciation sort of Facebook group. And oh, I think, yeah. I think that skews the, the Southwestern and Western novels. And, yeah. and I think, you know, there is a feeling among a lot of people there and, and, you know, it's, it's a valid opinion that, that he didn't, you know, he really found his voice when he went out West. And then there was a piece in the uh, Oxford American last year that I, I think that used those words that he found his voice with blood Meridian, hmm. which you know, okay, it's it's an amazing book. It's a great book. It's you could also put that up there as the great American novel. I've seen it, you know, on a on a long list of possible great American novels. But this was in Oxford American. This was the the mag a magazine of the South. And it's like I shouldn't be reading this. And you know, what was Blood Meridian was what maybe came out like six years after. Yeah, Sutri. eighty-five. Yeah. And like I'm thinking, like, have you not read Sutri? It is. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's it's he he had found his voice, and also I would say he, at that point, you know, er, his early early stuff. You could say you know the Faulkner influence influence was obvious, and and he talked about Faulkner being an influence. But but with Sutri, I mean, he he's Cormac McCarthy. There he is. He he doesn't owe anybody anything. He's his debt has been paid to to Faulkner. He's moved on, and he's doing his own thing, and like no one else can do. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's uh, for me, as far as the best and maybe favorite novels too, Sutri and Blood Meridian are sort of a tie, but you know, Sutri gets the home home team advantage for me being from Knoxville, but there's no question that as you say, and he's talked about the Faulknerian influence there in those early books, but by the time we get to Sutri, I mean, there's just nothing like it. And the marriage of the the sort of plot and themes of the book with that prose is uh, th there's there's never been prose quite like it. I don't think uh, some people find it a little a little purple, a little much, a little labored, but I think it's it's prose poetry uh, essentially, and he'll carry that over into Blood Meridian, but maybe have a scalpel to it and be a little more. Uh, he edits it a bit, and it's not as overflowing. It's not as uh, you know, it's not as flowery or, or gushing. But perhaps that's because that takes place in the West and which is a more barren landscape, which of course here in the South and Appalachia, it's, it is very lush and verdant and overgrown. And uh, I think the prose sort of leans into that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And I guess it does help if you, as a reader, you, you like that sort of thing. You, 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 you pick up a book, you know, for the writing maybe, and for the sentences and just the power of the, the, how, how the writer tells the story as opposed to, you know, something more plot driven. Uh, so it does, it does help, but uh, I mean, it's a, I don't think it's, it's, uh, I try to get people to read it a lot uh, and it's, it's big and it's thick and it's dense, but it's, I don't think it's, he's difficult to read in the same way that like Faulkner is difficult. To oh, read. No. Yeah. I mean, I think his sentences are just, McCarthy's sentences are just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, I love Faulkner and I think he's the best, but I, I, I would not necessarily would call a lot of his sentences uh, beautiful. I mean, a lot of, a lot of Faulkner right. is like, it's like, 
he didn't really care whether you read it or not or could understand it or not. He you he puts you through it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, uh, McCarthy will have you run into the dictionary some. Well, but, yeah, uh, about once or once or every other page probably. That's yeah. for sure. But so we're we're talking about this prose and uh, how great it is. Do you, do you mind to read a passage here from such? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to read uh, something, just a, a short, like a, about a half page from uh, near near the beginning, and it kind of kind of puts you right in the right in right in Knoxville. Uh, so here goes uh, Market Street on Monday morning, Knoxville, Tennessee. This year, in this year, 1951, Sutry with his parcel of fish going past the rows of derelict trucks piled with produ produce and flowers, an atmosphere rank with country commerce a reek of farm goods in the air, tending off into a light surmise of putrefaction and decay. Pariahs adorned the walk, and blind singers and organists and psalmists with mouth harps wandered up and down, past hardware stores and meat markets and little tobacco shops. A strong smell of feed in the hot noon like working mash, mute and roost peddlers watching from their wagon beds and flower ladies in their bonnets, like cowled gnomes, driftwood hands composed in their apron laps and their underlips swollen with snuff. He went among vendors and beggars and wild, wild street preachers haranguing a lost world with a vigor unknown to the sane. Sutry admired them with their hot eyes and dog-eared Bibles, God's barkers gone forth into the world like the prophets of old. He often stood along the edges of the crowd for some stray scrap of news from beyond the pale. He crossed the street, stepping gutters clogged with green stuff. Coming from behind the trucks, a beggar lady's splotched and marced arm barred his way, a palsied claw that gibbered at his chest. He slid past, stale, none like smell of her clothes, dry flesh within. The old almstress's eyes floated by in a mist of bitterness but he had nothing but his fish. Now, now see, that's poetry, right? I mean, who, yeah. who can't find the poetry in that? It's it's just yeah. wonderfully written. As you say, it's not uh, very difficult to get through. You, we know all those uh, words. It's just well-constructed. Uh, what strikes me, though, and that as beautiful as that prose is, a recurring theme in it is the word decay itself appears in there. We, we hear gnomes, we hear decay, palsied. There is a fascination with him, and especially in this book, with sort of a, a decay and things that are overlooked or neglected or or forgotten or decaying, um, the darker side of things. And I think that's another aspect of this book that might be a little off-putting to people or that might be something that the book has a reputation for having a lot of death and a lot of violence, which is true. Um, but, you know, there's also a lot of humor in it, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, kind of the darkness and decay in that what I just read was just kind of the, that's just the beginning. I mean, there's, there's much, there's, you know, human agony and, you know, there's all, you know, injuries, death, uh, everything, but, but yeah, it's, 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 the book has a whole scope of, it has a lot of humor. It has, it has a lot of like tender moments, uh, you know, Sutri in his community of, you know, kind of, uh, underworld Knoxville, you know, uh, people who are outside the mainstream. He's, he's a very generous person within that group. Everybody knows him and, and, you know, he, he gives advice and, and there are moments when, you know, there people are just together and just, just like being together and having, you know, a cup of coffee or whatever, or, or going to a bar and, and, yeah, we're, we're really and times. then, you know, th things go bad at the, at the bar, there's a fight and there are injuries and, you know, it's so, yeah, it's, he, he's, McCarthy is very funny. Uh, I, in, in the essay, I said, when it's, when it's, when it's funny, it's as funny as like a, con a confederacy of dunces. I mean, oh, I yeah. think it's that funny. Right. And yet it's also, you know, full of, you know, darkness and tragedy and it, and it works. It, you know, I don't think, you know, every, not every writer could pull that off. I don't think. Yeah. And, and this, the darkness and the humor sort of tie in with this idea. I, I think not long after that, it is toward the beginning where he, he's sort of drifting off and he's remembering his fa words that his father said about, um, if you want to know where life is, it's, uh, it's in government, it's in business, it's in law. And of course, you know, he's from this sort of 
well-to-do upper middle class family, but has chosen to reject that to live among the uh, sort of outcast homeless in Knoxville and finds that in fact, uh, that's what his father says where life is. It's, it's not where it is for him. Um, and so, as you say, he has this kindness and he's a mentor sort of to Gene Harrigan and others and is always helping people and looking out. But there's an, a, a strange dichotomy there because he left his own family, didn't he? I mean, he, he left his wife, his, um, his child died. And so there, there's sort of a uh, what a lot of people would see is almost as coldness or cruelty to an act like that. Um, at the same time, he shows so much compassion and so much uh, assistance and help to other people. Um, yeah, can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, he's 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 complicated, uh, and and he you, you described it exactly right. I mean, he he's a, a generous and kind and caring person who walked away from his young family uh, and walked away from you know his the family he grew up with, and you know, kind of I'm going to forsake all that. And I, I I think it's believable. You know that there are these two sides of him. I, I think that he he was he he could not live that life that was kind of set out for him. Uh, he couldn't do it. He couldn't. You know, he walked away from his family. He, you know, you could you could argue that that's obviously that's a selfish thing to do when you have, you know, it's one thing to leave your family, but it's, it's another thing if you 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 marry and have a child and then you walk mm -hmm. away from that too. Uh, but I, I would. He, he pays for it though. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he does Absolutely. what he wants. He lives the life he wants, but he suffers for it. I mean, he suffers great pain, uh, you know, after the, the child dies, uh, you know, so he, he, he doesn't get away. It, it isn't like he's living the easy free life with no worries. I mean, he's, right. you know, so. It's sort of in a tradition of, of some of the Russian novels, right? Dostoevsky and sort of the, uh, a real sort of uh, existentialness to, to what he's doing there. And um, not that Cormac left uh, a wife and child or anything, but in that echo of his uh, father telling him that, of course, his father worked for TVA. He was a very prominent uh, figure in there, and he chose to sort of go a different route and famously sort of lived a very um, Spartan life so he could follow it and dedicated to his writing. Uh, this is, you know, you don't want to read too much into it, I guess, in these texts, but it is supposedly his most um, autobiographical novel as well. And as you said, Ulysses, evoking that, famously, uh, you know, Joyce sort of mapped Dublin so well in that book, and Sutri does the exact same thing. Um, it's remarkable how, when you look, go back and look at uh, photographs and images and newspaper accounts, how accurately he describes Knoxville and and people involved as well. I mean, the people in that are are based on real people. Yeah, you've you've done a lot of research, obviously there, and you know know the city. Uh, was it? Could you? Was it? Was it hard to kind of track and and find? And were you were you discovering that? I, I wonder, like, how he did that. I mean, how he because the book is set in the early fifties. So what what was was he writing somewhat from from memory? How old would he have been at that point in the fifties? He would, yeah, he would have he would have been in his twenties and um, okay. you know get, entering into that around that time. So he definitely lived that through that. And I, I've got to say, um, Sutri has a really it's a strange kind of legacy here in Knoxville um, because most people in Knoxville have never heard of this book. Most people in Knoxville would probably not want to read this book or read it if they. Had the opportunity, but it does have this really loyal and uh, passionate following amongst some people. And I, I got to give a shout out to Wes Morgan, especially. He's the one who who did so much research into the real life locations and the people involved. He he has these websites dedicated um, to the locations of Sutri today, basically, where, where they are in the book. And also he has a site called Sutri Cemetery, where he traces all the people in it, not all the people, but many of the people in it and who they were in real life and where they were buried. I, I don't know if he's working on a book, but I hope he is because um, it would be remarkable. And then I happened to work at um, Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, where we had all these great you know, film clips from home movies and news footage of Knoxville at that time period. And, you know, we'd come across things like the goat man who's described in the book. There he is in, in this news footage. 
And if you, you read some of the descriptions of Sutri's uh, meanderings and wanderings, indeed, all of these places, the movie theaters, the shops, the drugstores are there uh, the way he describes them. So it's, it's kind of a remarkable book in that way. Um, th there's not a whole lot of others like it in, in terms of how accurately it describes a time and a place. Yeah, again, like like kind of like Ulysses, because it it bears studying. You you can you know go through Ulysses and find you know this person was that care that real person, and and I went to to uh, uh, Dublin uh, about five or six years ago, and 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 I did like months of research before it because I wanted to go to pubs where uh, like. Joyce drank or Joyce's characters drank. And there's a lot of them you can do, you know, they have plaques on the wall and, and, you know, you could, you can find a where, you know, character where, you know, Bloom, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the, like Davy Burns, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So you yeah, can do the same kind of thing with this. Yeah. There, there's a bar here uh, called Sutri's actually, but um, I've always thought it was ironic because um, it's a high priced, uh, you know, craft beer, high gravity, that Sutri and his friends would never set foot in, would right. probably maybe not be welcome. There's a park here, Sutri's Landing, sort of near the area where the he, you know, pushed the police car into the river. It's a family gathering. You know, there's a, there's a playground there. A lot of people walk their dogs. There's quotes from this book all over the city. Uh, but it, and that's great. It, it, they're sort of honoring what this book is, but it sort of elides the, 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 a lot of the themes or a lot of what the book is getting at, I think, in terms of how this kind of thing, uh, this, this rejection of middle class life, right? And this, mm -hmm. this kind of embracing and understanding of uh, poverty and homelessness and the, the underside of things. Yeah, the, like the the change change that happened in, in cities and, and so-called progress, you know, progress tends to leave a lot of people behind. Uh, mm -hmm. and leaves them not just behind, but worse off than they were. Uh, so, yeah, yeah that, that book ends with, um, you know, it, it's essentially urban, the beginning of urban renewal, which was not unique to Knoxville, of course, that happened all over the country. It's a very conscious decision to destroy neighborhoods and communities in the name of progress, in the name of, of uh, developing businesses, et cetera. Of course, um, you know, TVA and other people, they, he, he lives on the river, right, in a houseboat. Yeah. And so many people did, uh, which is kind of hard to imagine or fathom now, if you live in modern Knoxville, all these houseboats and all these people living along the Tennessee River, because now you've got a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse down there, <laughs> and that's where the Vol Navy comes in, all the the, the wealthy um, uh, Tennessee Vol sports fan comes in. That's where, uh, you know, all a lot of Sutri takes place and where Gene Harrogate was living and where Sutri was living. So it's, it's just a strange sort of... Um, you know, we, we honor this book and love it here, but also um, don't want to talk about certain aspects of it, you know? Right, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in your research, did you, were you able to kind of discover to what extent this might be autobiographical or is it more, uh, you know, McCarthy just kind of used his actual life maybe as a jumping off point and the details are not the same. I mean, he didn't go live on the river necessarily, but he did kind of go his own way. Yeah, right. I don't think he actually lived on the river. If he did, it was, it was a very brief period of time. He actually moved uh, not long after outside of the city to to do a lot of his writing. But he was a very, um, you know, sort of self-sufficient person uh, in some ways like Sutri in terms of like uh, building his own uh, home and being able to sort of make his way without much money or uh, without much uh, like a, a real job. <laughs> sort right, of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of he was uncompromising kind of, he, he, he was doing it his way and wasn't going to, you know, he didn't, didn't do the normal thing of writers. He didn't, I guess he didn't teach it all anywhere. Right. And, and Wouldn't give, he gave very few interviews, you know, yeah. Not, yeah. Not very in some early interviews. newspaper, like regional newspapers or that was, that was really early on. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but yeah, at a certain point, no. And it, it didn't sound like it was probably easy to be his, his spouse at that point in his life. It was kind of, it wasn't easy living, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I understand. It's like, a, it was, as I said, it was a Spartan existence. And uh, that very classic old school idea of being so dedicated to your art. And, you know, there's, there's a new book uh, 
that was recently published, Big Fiction, I think is the name of it, but it's about the publishing industry in, in the 80s and how there's a conscious shift towards, uh, you know, well, just big business getting into publishing. And there's a part in there about how McCarthy made a conscious decision, sort of got a new agent and everything um, after Blood Meridian uh, with all the pretty horses mm -hmm. sort of become a bit more commercial. Not that anyone would argue that those later books are uh, not great literature or aren't, uh, you know, that he compromised in any way. But there's definitely a difference between the Border Trilogy, right? And and, oh, such, and certainly Blood Meridian. So um he, he definitely lived quite a life of, uh, uh, you know, struggle and dedicated to his art and I think did make a conscious shift to try to make it as a writer or get paid for it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know why he why he moved uh, out west, why he kind of made his way west? Was it did it uh, did it have anything to do with being a writer and being a Southern writer and a Southern writer who was constantly compared to, to Faulkner. I don't know whether that had any, whether he even cared about that, but, but that's kind of what happened to him as, as a Southern novelist who, who wrote the way he wrote, it was like, you, you almost couldn't pick up a review without seeing, you know, Faulkner mentioned it's, sure. in, in, you know, in the, I was looking at the, the New York times obituary of when he died in uh, what, 2023, and it said, you know, of the Tennessee books, uh, where is it? It's, uh, yeah, bleak fables set in Appalachian South related in, tang related in tangled prose that owes an acknowledged debt to William Faulkner. Hey, that's that's not too far I off. I mean, that's good, that's good <laughs> company, but, you know, um, I mean, Sutri doesn't, Sutri doesn't know a debt to anybody. Right, right. You know, I, I wonder if that got to him at all. If, if that's, that's a good question. I don't know why he, he could... He could be the guy. Yeah, I don't know why he, he moved, chose El Paso, actually, which is, of course, where he went before New Mexico. I don't know uh, what instigated that. Um, I'm sure, I mean, you know, the, again, it's Knoxville, so there are people around that knew him still. And But that's what's interesting about him, too, is like as guarded as he was and didn't give many interviews, people who knew him um, are also the same way. It's almost like a loyalty or a... Right. Sort of, you know, you don't want to be trading those secrets. There's a, there's a question here in the chat. Are there homes or other places connected to him that you can visit in Knoxville? His childhood home burned down um, several years ago. And there was sort of like the remnants of it in the chimney there, but it's it's gone. And then, as I mentioned, he moved outside of town to um, uh, Louisville, which is near Maryville, which is near here. And there is um, a house that's still there. Um but other than that, there's there's not like, uh, you know, I mean, there's uh, Wes Morgan, the guy I mentioned earlier, is actually doing research. And he he discovered that Cormac's family might have lived somewhere um, earlier than what is thought to be his um, his earliest home. So we'll mm -hmm. wait and hear more from that. And maybe you can, there's a question above it. I don't know if you want to tackle that one. That's a big one. Yeah, was Cormac McCarthy deserving of the Nobel Prize in Literature? Why do you think he was not awarded it? Uh, I, I think he was <laughs> deserving of of every every prize for for the written word. Uh, why he was not awarded it? Uh, I don't know. It seems to me kind of a mysterious process of of who who wins, who's considered. Uh, I don't know. I don't really have an answer to that at all. Do you? Yeah, I mean, the Nobel's kind of uh, controversial anyway, right? I mean, going back to like some early earlier American writers who were thought to be a bit a bit mid or, or maybe not deserving of it um, to recently, you know, Bob Dylan winning it. Right. So, uh, yeah, who knows what that process is like, because it doesn't seem to be um, based on, you know, it's, it's not a, a wording, uh, the hot topic or the people that are responding to the moment. It's it's clearly more than just prose as well. So, um, uh, yeah. Although I didn't have a tr any problem with Bob Dylan winning it either. I'm a big Bob Dylan fan. So. Oh yeah, same. I mean, it's it it was just a uh, as you remember, sort of a big flashpoint and and right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, so we've reached the half hour mark, and we're gonna. Are there, are there any other questions? Um, 
we're going to take some questions if you guys have any. That just flew by. Yeah, okay. Yeah, is is he still an influential writer? Um, that's a good question, right? Because he's so singular. Um, as we were saying, especially Sutri, there's nothing quite like it and nobody writing anything like it. I know he's still read. He's still talked about, clearly. Um, can you think of anyone that you would say is... I mean, William Gay, I thought... One, yeah, that William Gay is who I was going to say. Uh, well, he just and, came out. Yeah, and, and yeah. William died, what, how many years has it been? Uh, not sure, but I remember when I first read him, it was just yeah. like, oh, this guy's clearly. I, I think that th there aren't two, there aren't, as far as the Southern uh, books, I don't think there are too many writers or books that you can say that's, you know, kind of, these are, you know, Cormac McCarthy like books or his influence is obvious because I, I just don't think anybody can write like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the sentences and the, the, you know, the, the word choice and just, I mean, he just builds these incredible sentences. And then the next one is, is just as impressive. Uh, but William Gay was really good. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, he, he could do it. I mean, he had, he had the chops to write, you know, books that were worthy of, of McCarthy, I thought. Uh, but I, I think it, it's hard to do. It's, 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 uh, I, I think there are a lot of like in Southern literature, I read a lot of, uh, I, I tend to read older stuff, but when I read contemporary stuff, most of it to me seems like it's it's very good. The stories are well told. The writing is good. But it's like Larry Brown's already written this book. I right. read a lot of there are a lot of writers who write like Larry Brown because he didn't he wrote in a much more kind of plain spoken style. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see him. I see his influence. But I think it has to do with writing style. I don't think anybody could do quite what Cormac McCarthy did. But William Gay came pretty close. Well, yeah, if, if you're writing like McCarthy, you're kind of showing your hand, right? And that's why I thought of William Gay. The first time I read him, I was like, oh, this guy has read McCarthy and is trying to do that. And if you do that, it really does sort of jump out immediately. Um, there's a question about uh, McCarthy's Catholicism. He attended Catholic schools, but he didn't uh, ascribe to any particular faith. I don't normally see him on a list of Catholic writers like Walker Percy or Flanner O'Connor, the Sutri feels very much to me like the work of a Catholic writer. The struggle with morality, certainly in his actions, the struggle to do the right thing. Um, is McCarthy considered a Catholic writer like Percy or O'Connor? That is a great question. And of course, he does, you know, he did, McCarthy attended Catholic Church, and it appears in Sutri, the very church that he attended, he writes it in there. And when he is having a, a crisis of faith or a moment of, of real, um, darkness, he, he goes to the church. And this is something, David, you and I talked about, you know, before this is like, there is most certainly a, a sort of wrestling with God or a struggle with the idea of, um, I, I don't even know if it's religion, right? It's God, it's the cosmos, right. throughout all of his works, and especially in the most recent ones, the, the Passenger and Stella Maris, uh, there's definitely a sensibility of um, what to do, or, or, you know, how do you um, exists in a world where it seems that God has abandoned almost seems to be kind of a, a theme uh, for those books. Um, I don't know. It, it's a huge question. I don't know how, how much it's seen. I'm sure there's a, a ton of writing because there's so much writing about McCarthy on the sort of Catholic influences. Um, but I think Percy and O'Connor, it's way more pronounced. Yeah, almost anything you 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 see about you know anything going deep into like Flannery O'Connor, it's always mentioned. Although curiously, and and I don't see it mentioned with with McCarthy, but I do like like you said, and like the the question has it. Those those themes are there very much. So the the it's a little little bit off subject, but the the interesting thing for me with Flannery O'Connor is I always see that you know the Catholic influence. I don't see it when I read her stories though. Mm. I. I I, I read a lot of her story, I, and I love Flannery O'Connor, but I read a lot of those stories, and it strikes me as someone who who probably is not religious at all and and is kind of mocking religion. I mean, and that's a lot of, you know, some of what she did. I don't, I didn't, I don't really see where Catholicism is evident. 
in, well, her, in a lot of her stories. It could still be an influence though, right? I mean, I've always, I've, I was uh, brought up in the Methodist church myself, but I was heard with Catholicism. It's kind of, uh, you, you don't really escape it. The sort of indoctrination is, is such a, uh, the ritual and the, the seriousness of it, like even if you reject it consciously as you become an adult, if you were brought up in that faith, it leaves this sort of imprint that's difficult. And maybe like you say, that's what she's reacting against. Maybe McCarthy is uh, as well. Yeah. I was raised Catholic, so I, you're, you're right. Oh, about well, it. sorry. It's, you you can speak to that better than me. Yeah, right. yeah, it's with you. Even if you, even if you walk away, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. And that, now Serenity's asking, uh, do we have thoughts about the depiction of race in Sutri? It's a gorgeous novel, but that aspect definitely feels troubling. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing about it is I think, um, as I was saying about uh, how so many aspects of the novel remain relevant, like the idea of like this, uh, the urban renewal and uh, homelessness. Knoxville's not alone in this, of course, but, um, you know, housing prices are increasing and homelessness is growing here. It's a real issue. And, and it so much of it reflects what's in, in the novel. And, um, y you know, when it comes to race, that's another thing is like, there's clearly racist police in this, uh, the, at Franklin, they, they beat him. Um, there's, and that's still sort of a, an aspect that's clearly within our culture. Um, there's also, of course, um, you know, the, the part where he's in North Carolina and there's a black guy that comes up and tells him they'll vag you here, trying mm -hmm. to, to code, let him know that, you know, don't don't get caught looking like a vagabond or looking um, homeless or they'll get you. Um, yeah, I don't know that the language that he uses is, is, is can be a bit troubling. Um, yeah, it's I, I feel like there's a, a sympathy there, but I also feel like clearly it's a majority white novel and the city itself is um and the reflection there's there's sort of almost like a voodoo like quality with um the the wife the franklin's wife so i it, i think it also think it it's kind of troubling but um like a lot of southern literature yeah, yeah exactly yeah, I mean, it's hard to escape if you know you could eudora welty faulkner or any anybody flannery o'connor yeah. Do, do you say it's like a point of view of the character that he's, uh, is, is he racist or is the author racist or is, is the, the culture he is? Uh, he's yeah. Well, with, I guess with, with Summary, I think it's been said of, 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 of I guess, of Flannery O'Connor that, that you look at her letters, there's, there's racism in her letters. Mm -hmm. But when she sat down to write a story, she was, she was kind of more on on the right side of of, of humanity uh, that her better and I think the argument was not that not she, she changed because she didn't want people who were reading her books to to think oh she's not a racist but it was more that her better side came out when she was creating her fiction is I, I is, is what I've is, is the argument that I've read yeah but and but when we get down to it what we have is the text right and so when reading Sutri or just reading these questions about how problem I, I think there is some problematic stuff in there about race. I do think once again that there is a as a sympathy and an acknowledgement of um, how you know police and the culture at large could be racist, but some of the language is maybe well, I don't know, maybe it does lean into some uh, uh, objectification and, and racist kind of yeah. language. But do you and, think as, a, as characters go, do you think Sutri was racist? I mean, again, 1950s Knoxville. Uh, he he was probably. I mean, we all are, right? But I mean, I mean, he was probably a reflection of his time of somebody that was a bit smarter and more well read than those around him. But certainly, probably harder harbored some of those tendencies, right? I mean, that's right. kind of like that's not an easy question because I think we all are. I mean, I think that's just sort of the culture we were then. He was probably less racist than most, but also, you know, had. Just because yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Yeah. yeah. And um, Serenity's mentioned in the film here, and, and that is something I wanted to make uh, clear when we did that. Um, so part of the reason I, I'm talking about this is I mentioned I work at uh, the Tennessee Archive Moving Image and Sound, where we had all these great film clips and also photographs of that time period. 
And over the years, I would sort of tag them as like, oh, that happened in Sutri, because I'm a big fan of that book, read it multiple times. And so if I saw the goat man, if I saw certain locations, I would just sort of tag it. And then after years, I put it into a sort of uh, chronological logical narrative that corner, uh, you know, followed the book along like that. And that is something toward the end that we have footage. It's not even from the 1950s. It's as recent as the 70s um, of the sort of urban renewal renewal that was going on and of, of kind of the the homelessness and difficulty that's still occurring. So that's something I wanted to thread in that as well, is that the themes he was talking about in this book, I mean, it's a big book, as you said, there's a lot going on. There's all this um, stuff happening within uh, sort of a cultural way, but there's also this existential or moral crisis this man is going through. So it's an extremely rich uh, novel that I think still has incredible relevance and and will probably for um, decades decades to come well said well said well i okay um if there's no more questions do, do, do you have a, a a defining or summing statement here uh not, not really i would just i would really encourage people to to give the book a chance uh mm -hmm. it's 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 not that difficult. The, the, the opening words are the first two words are dear friend. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, uh, yeah. he's inviting you in and then, you know, you'll have a, maybe have a dictionary by your side and, and maybe a, a stiff drink, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's uh -huh. just a wonderful book. It's, it's just, it's not like, it's not like reading Faulkner is difficult. It's, it's, it's the sentences are just amazing and beautiful. And the, the, if you, if you're a fan of words and word choice and uh, you know, the, like the, the passage that I read there, you know, I, I said it in, in my essay, I said it, that it was the greatest collection of sentences, this side of uh, the collected stories of Eudora Welty, who I think is also mm -hmm. like the great sentence writer. Uh, so, I mean, you can just enjoy it all kinds of ways. Like you can enjoy a book like Ulysses. You don't have to necessarily read it from, start to finish you can you can jump around or you can just enjoy the language you know kind of the rhythm of the lines uh so there are lots of ways but i would say give such a chance yeah it's kind of like the bible that way huh yeah it's a uh, beautiful language a lot of a lot of uh a lot of things happening in it a lot of uh humor and a lot of um uh yeah you, you can read it as prose poetry i feel like sometimes i'll just pick it up and read it i don't I don't, you know, care where we are in the plot or what's happening. It's just beautiful to read or to read that language. Absolutely. And on that note of beauty, we will wrap up our wonderful evening here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eric, so much uh, for joining us. Thank you uh, to the friends out there as well. Uh, and we will uh, continue celebrating our 50 years and 50 books. And, um, yeah, happy reading out there, y'all. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good night.